But I also welcome you on the Department of Ed, uh, on behalf of the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology because um, our guest is sponsored um, by the Wendell R. Faculty Institute. Most of you are probably aware that the Institute for Advanced Study was established to facilitate and encourage faculty research and creative activity. We do this in a number of ways. Uh, we do it by a series of inter- or transdisciplinary seminars. We do it by a named lectureship. But most of all, we do it by a series of visiting fellows to Indiana University. Any faculty person on any campus of Indiana University can nominate a, fa a fellow to come to Indiana University to collaborate or consult on a particular issue or question. We don't ask very much of these fellows, except that they give a public lecture so that their expertise can be shared beyond um, the confines of the people who are actually working with them. And it is, of course, that lecture that brings us here this afternoon. And it's my pleasure to turn things over to my colleague in the Folklore and Ethnomusicology Department, Hassan El Shami, who will introduce our speaker. especially folk narrative research. Uh, Professor Ulrich Matzoff is one of the editors of the perhaps the most important work in folk narrative research today. Uh, that's the insight of this Mersch, a work that has been in progress for almost perhaps more than a quarter of a century and promises to continue. Uh, for many more years. Uh, those of you who are familiar with this publication uh, realize that it is actually one of the foundations you know, for uh, reference works, studies in folk narrative, legends, and anything that has to do with the art or the craft of describing life and or living. It's characterized by a great deal of precision, meticulous uh, research, and uh, continued value for interdisciplinary work. It is of significance to folklorists, folk narrative researchers, classicists, literary scholars, uh, historians, and so forth. I have known Professor Martzoff for more than 15 years. Uh, uh, we got introduced via one of his works. Uh, he has uh, a, an incredibly impressive curriculum vita, starting his publications in 1983 with uh, work on Persian folklore. He did his dissertation on the typology of the Persian folk narrative. This work, which was published in 1984, is now a classic. Uh, it would be you know, quite redundant to actually start listing his publications, all of which are very impressive. However, he has actually distinguished himself in a number of areas, especially you know, the study of humor and the trickster. The trickster really cuts, especially Nasser bin Hoja or Joha, and so forth, that cuts across or actually uh, presents himself in Turkish traditions, in Persian traditions, in Arabic traditions. Uh, and these are really languages and cultures of which Professor Martzov are at home, at home with. Uh, he also has a number of works on Islam. Uh, folk life in Muslim societies and Middle Eastern societies, and especially in the relationship between life and the folk narrative. Today, his presentation is going to focus on a very significant work, especially in these years, 
In two years, the Arabian Nights will have completed 300 years of existence, or actually presence, in Europe. Uh, so to commemorate uh, the translation by Antoine Galland, which represented the height of the uh, <coughs> romantic philosophical fascination with the East, there are numerous uh, symposia being held out through the entire world. Uh, Professor Mark Solf is going to discuss a significant topic that is narrative strategies that are actually used by, here instead of actually, say, oral tale tellers, but actually writers and tellers via, via <coughs> writing with particular emphasis on the Arabian Nights and the Arabian Night-like traditions. And one of his most important works that just appeared last year was a translation of what could have been another volume of the Arabian Nights. You know, see, that's the wondrous uh, tales uh, by Hans Wirt. I can tell you, I, uh, you know, my admiration you know, for the translation and for the annotation of this work have actually been uh, overwhelming. So I present to you a very much of Dear Mary Ellen, dear Hassan, first of all, thanks very much for the kind introduction and for getting me over, which I very much enjoy, having the pleasure to be here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the topic of my presentation, as announced by Hassan, is narrative strategies in medieval Arabic popular literature. And I am going to talk more or less about the Thousand and One Nights. And as the announcement says, other anthologies of its time, which in particular, uh, in particular is this one collection that Hassan already mentioned in Arabic, the Hikayat Ajiba, or Wonderful Stories. Research in the 18th and 19th century manuscripts of the Arabian Nights has unveiled their curious characteristics. Though the history of the Arabian Nights as a collection can be traced back to the 10th century CE, anything likely to be regarded as a Vulgate text of the Arabian Nights was not created until late in the 18th century. Moreover, the 18th and 19th century Arabic manuscripts were compiled in direct response to the European demand for complete editions that had been initiated by the enthusiastic reception of Antoine Galland's first ever translation to the Arabian, of the Arabian Nights into European language, whose first volume was published in 1704. And that is particularly the reason why there are going to be worldwide celebrations of the 300th anniversary in 2004. In order to satisfy demand, the compilers of these manuscripts exploited a large range of sources additional to the basic stock of Arabian Nights tales. As David Pinot, in his 1992 study, Storing Telling Techniques in the Arabian Nights, has put it, the manuscript redactors were the heirs and recipients of a venerable storytelling lineage. The range of material these compilers exploited is vast, besides anecdotes and stories of all kind comprising geographical and historical literature. And so far, only parts of the narrative repertoire of the Arabian Nights has been studied in relation to their sources, such as most recently, the small corpus of fables inserted after the tale of Omar ibn al Nu'man. Out of the hundreds of anonymous narrative compilations in Arabic manuscript tradition preserved in libraries in the West and in the Near East, 
that might have served as a source of inspiration for the Arabic compilers in one way or other, one is of particular importance. While most relevant texts date comparatively recent, the unique manuscript published in 1956 by Hans Wehr under the title al hakayat al ajiba Wonderful Stories, according to paleographical evidence, was probably compiled as early as the 14th century. If this dating holds true, it would make the Hikayat older than the oldest extant manuscript of the Arabian Nights, the Galon manuscript, commonly supposed to date from the 15th century. While some scholars have seen the Hikayat as a fragment of the monumental compilation of narratives attempted by the 10th century author al jashiari it is highly interesting to note that they contain a number of tales also encountered in later redactions of the Arabian Nights. Rather than elaborating on the former hypothesis, which to my opinion is rather far-fetched, it is some of the latter tales I propose to discuss here. Out of the 18 tales contained in the Hikayat's only preserved volume, four correspond directly to tales included in the Arabian Nights. These are the tales of the Barber's brothers, Jullah Nar the Seaborn, Jubair ibn Umair and the Lady Budur, and Abu Muhammad Lazy Bones. This is the titles as the translation of Richard Burton gives them. A fifth tale, the one of the 40 girls, is represented in the Arabian Nights in an abridged form. And yet another tale from the Hikayat, the one of Sul and Shamul is known both from a 16th century Egyptian manuscript and from a Tübingen manuscript in which it is broken up into nights, probably so as to be inserted into a redaction of the Arabian Nights, then on the preparation. Out of these tales common to both the Hikayat and the Arabian Nights, I have chosen three that in different ways are relatable to my topic of strategies. As a disclaimer, I should probably mention that I understand the term strategy in a wide notion, primarily in its relation to textual arrangements and the effects they have on the intended as well as the implicit meaning of a given tale. I'm going to discuss these textual developments as resulting from different objectives on the part of the narrators. These objectives are linked with narrative strategies by which tales are adopted to changing needs. With this theoretical in mark, a remark in mind, I propose to discuss different versions of three tales as examples for three different types of narrative adaptation. The tale of Abu Muhammad Lazy Bones, as an example for different interpretations in vaguely contemporary versions. The tale of Jullah Nar as an example for an Eastern tale gone west. And finally, the tale of the 40 girls as a highly adaptable, adaptable scheme, preserving its main idea even in reduced versions. The tale of Abu Muhammad, the sluggard, as Gustav Edmund von Grünenbaum has rendered its title, is essentially the tale of an absurdly lazy young man who, with the help of a magic monkey, becomes incredibly rich. The tale begins with the Caliph Harun al-Rashid looking for a large jewel to be put in a particular place of the new crown his wife, or in the Hikayat his sister, has had prepared. As Harun's treasury does not hold any fitting jewel, he's told that the only person likely to meet his needs is the said Abu Muhammad. Summoned to the Caliph palace, Abu Muhammad displays his richness lavishly, and when questioned about the sources for his wealth, becomes what Svetan Todorov has labeled an homme He tells us who he is by telling his story. After this prologue, the actual tale starts as a first-person narrative. 
Abu Muhammad relates how, as a youth, he used to be so lazy as to drive his mother mad about him. Actually, the one and only occasion he ever got up was in order to ask a merchant about to depart for a journey to buy some goods for him. The merchant accepts, but later forgets about his promise and only on the return journey buys a worn-out monkey for Abu Muhammad. This monkey turns out to be a magic creature who manages to accumulate tremendous riches in the name of Abu Muhammad by fetching jewels or pearls from the bottom of the sea. After the merchant's return, he hands everything over to Abu Muhammad, who becomes the richest man in town. Soon after, Muhammad, uh, Abu Muhammad is made to realize that the monkey actually is a powerful demon who induces him to assist in acquiring a certain girl the demon has unsuccessfully wooed for a long time. As Abu Muhammad is given the girl in marriage, he destroys a certain magic spell protecting the girl and the demon abducts her. Only after a strenuous journey in search of her, involving mention and sometimes practice of various magic devices, the girl is reunited with Abu Muhammad and both return home. This general outline fits both versions of the tale, yet they also contain several differences. Generally speaking, the tale is constructed in four parts. First, the prologue, introducing the protagonist and inducing him to relate his tale. Second, the first part in which an apparently undeserving protagonist becomes rich with the help of a magic creature. Third, an interlude separating the lovers. And fourth, a second part in which the lovers are reunited and the demon is destroyed. The Hekayat version, moreover, starts with the Caliph Harun al-Rashid strolling around town with his vizier Jafar. As Harun witnesses Abu Muhammad's tremendous wealth, he returns home in an angry mood only to be faced with his sister's request for the large jewel. His wrath is then further increased by the fact that his own treasury does not hold any fitting jewel and he's thus forced to ask Abu Muhammad for help. This introduction enables the narrator to have Abu Muhammad summoned summon to the caliph immediately, while in the version of the Arabian Nights, Abu Muhammad, who is not known to the caliph, at first entertains the messengers lavishly before following the caliph's friendly invitation. Besides this additional introductory passage, a few of the more significant differences between the two versions might be mentioned rapidly. First, in the actual tale's initial situation, both versions elaborate on Abu Muhammad's laziness. But while in the Arabian Nights, his mother assists him in delivering the, monk, the money to the merchant in the Hikayat, he walks all by himself. Second, when the merchant on his return journey, journey is reminded of his promise, in the Arabian Nights, this <coughs> constitutes a conscious act of remembering. In the Hikayat, the ship suddenly stops moving and is only relieved when the merchant remembers his promise. Third, in the Hekayat, the magic monkey dives for pearls in Oman, a place so near to Abu Muhammad's hometown in southern Iraq that the episode is directly followed by the merchant's return. In the Arabian Nights, the monkey dives for jewels at an unnamed island. As the riches he acquires this way are still comparatively modest, he is given another opportunity to accumulate money in compensation for delivering the company of merchants from the cannibal Negroes in Zanzibar. Fourth, when Abu Muhammad's bride has been abducted by the evil demon, in the Hikayat, without any particular reason, he receives help and advice from a friendly Muslim demon. In the Arabian Nights instead, he earns the gratitude of a clan of magic white snakes by killing a black snake that he had found fighting with one of them. 
fifth, most significant of all, the final episode in the Hikayat is extremely short. When Abu Muhammad has reached the demon's palace after a short journey through magic realms, he finds his beloved one peacefully reading the Quran, as the demon has already been destroyed. In the Arabian Nights, Abu Muhammad is submitted to a complicated procedure involving a magic flight on the back of a demon, an encounter with the mythical saint Khedr, a journey to the city of brass, and the conscious application of a magic talisman. André Miquel has identified the underlying message of this tale as treating the legitimacy of power. When destiny allows even such a ridiculously lazy person as Abu Muhammad to accumulate riches larger than those of the caliph himself, the caliph's rule, by analogy, is shown to result from destiny rather than from a legitimate claim to power. The central theme would thus be fate, God's absolute capacity to decide whatever he wants, or in Michel's profane formula, the caprice du hasard. This theme is elaborated in both versions, albeit with different tendencies. And it is here that one might ponder about the wording of narrative strategies. In both versions of the tale, the prologue and the first part, uh, in both versions of the tale, the prologue and the first part account for about half of the total text, while the other half is occupied by the interlude and the second part. In the version of the Arabian Nights, however, the tale's final part accounts for about a third of the total text as compared to a sixth of the total text in the version of the Hikayat. This gives the Arabian Nights version a climax towards the end, stressing the work of destiny in its incomprehensible and magical dimension. The narrator of the Hikayat version, on the other hand, has constructed the final part in a rather pragmatical manner. It is short, contains few details, and in having God kill the demon in response to, to the distressed girl's sincere prayer, it stresses human responsibility in contrast to fatalistic surrender to the incomprehensible working of fate. Human responsibility is also pointed out in the tale's initial scene. While in the Arabian Nights version, Abu Muhammad leans on his mother to meet the merchant, in the Hikayat version, he gets up and walks by himself. Similarly, in the Hikayat, the forgetful merchant remembers to fulfill his promise, not by chance, as in the Arabian Nights, but through the magic standstill of his ship, constituting a strong call to keep up to his promise and act responsible. This strategy of varying minor details, such as these, in the end up, in, in the end, adds up to ma major modification in the tale's implicit message. While both versions accept God's ultimate authority and the inexplicable working of fate, the Hekayat version supplies the human factor with a high degree of responsibility for the own action within the given frame. In terms of genre theory, such a tendency, of course, does not generate a new genre yet it might modify the text to such a degree as to leave a different impression in its listeners and hence generate new levels of meaning, or in other words, a different intentional genre. René Basset, the first one to study the tale of Abu Muhammad in his Arabian Nights version, regarded it as a rather recent and, as he said, badly constructed concoction of motives also appearing in other tales. While the sheer fact that the use of many motifs is not restricted to this particular tale certainly holds true, Basset's evaluation misses the point that tales are never told without an intention. A version such as that of the Arabian Nights 
in elaborating the strange and the wonderful elements may be regarded as belonging to a chiefly entertaining genre. The version of the Hikayat, on the other hand, in stressing human responsibility, underlines the educative message that even the smallest amount of human activity and responsibility will be rewarded. In order to drive this point home, both the initial ir irresponsible laziness of the hero as well as the ensuing rewards are exaggerated to extremes. Stripped of these popular distortions, aiming at entertaining illustration and boiled down to its essential message, the version of the Hikayat becomes an outright didactic tale. While the two versions of the tale discussed so far are considerably ancient, it is interesting to note what the compiler of the so-called Wortley Montague manuscript, which was produced in the middle of the 18th century, has made of this tale. His version is both heavily abridged and stripped of the initial eponymous passages. Here we simply encounter a young beggar who buys a dog-faced baboon with the little savings he has. Back home, the monkey straightforward changes into a handsome young man, exclaiming in Burton's antiquated English, query me no questions concerning whatso thou shalt see for good luck has come to thee. After the hero Muhammad has acquired the bride, here the sultan's daughter, and disabled the talisman protecting her from the demon, instead of her being abducted, it is him who's thrown out of his magnificent home and reduced to his former poverty. When strolling around town, a North African, or to be exact, a Maghribi sorcerer, hands him a magic note addressed at the Lord of Demons with the help of which the letter is convinced to punish the mischievous jinni and return Muhammad to his wife. Besides abridgment, what has happened here can best be characterized by the term rationalization. The tale's essential elements are preserved, but while the initial argument the hero's absurd laziness and his deserved compensation when acting responsible is flattened. The final reward, marriage with the sultan's daughter and acquisition of the rule, is heightened to extremes. Both tendencies, in contrast to the previous stress on either fate or self-responsibility, work for a rational understanding of the tale inasmuch as the magic ingredients are less prominent. Neither are the monkey's wonderful capacities elaborated, nor the destruction of the girl's talisman, nor even the young man's adventures in search of his bride. Instead of the working of magic, the focus in this 18th century version lies on authority, the authority of wealth, of knowledge, and of power. Even the mischievous jinni is not destroyed by a magic procedure. The helpful sorcerer does not activate his magic qualities, instead applying authority by simply writing a note, notably of undisclosed content, to the lord of the demons. The latter, in turn, also does not put to work a magic procedure, but rather has the jinni punished by justice, ruling within the framework of a rationalized hierarchy that also reigns in the world of demons. So much as for Abu Muhammad. The second tale to be discussed, the one of the mermaid Jolanar, shall be regarded from a different angle, as both versions of the tale in the Hekayat and in the Arabian Nights are more or less convergent. <coughs> instead of comparing their realization in detail, I instead propose to discuss the tale's version in a late 18th century European text as an example for narrative strategies adapting the Eastern tale to a Western value system. The tale of Julanar is composed in two parts. The mermaid herself is only the protagonist of the first one, while the second part elaborates on the adventures of her son Badr 
as he's called in the Hikayat, or Bad al-Basim, as the Arabian Nights render his name. One is a full moon, and the other one has an additional laughing full moon to it. Since the tale's second part does not feature in the European adaptation, we may leave it aside for the present discussion. The tale of Jul Nar starts by King Shahriyar, or in the Arabian Nights Shahriman, in the northeastern Persian province of Khorasan, being childless, despite his multitude of wives and concubines. One day, he's offered a slave girl who is extremely beautiful, but refuses to speak. He falls in love with her, and while neglecting his other wives, dedicates his, only, his time only to her. When she has become pregnant, she finally speaks to him and informs him that she's the daughter of the king of the ocean. As she's about to give birth, she summons her family by ways of a magic pre procedure. Soon after the boy's birth, Julana's family returns to the sea, and the child is initiated into the life underwater by his uncle. The boy grows up, is educated in the arts, and after his father's death, becomes his successor. From now on, the Arabic versions develop the young man's adventures in finding and, as one might say, convincing his bride. The <coughs> European version I propose to contrast with the Arabic ones is contained in an anonymous collection published in 1801 under the title of Feenmeerchen, or Tales of the Fairies. It introduces the young ruler as an oriental named Ahmed, who, though his harem is full of beautiful women, is craving for love rather than sensual pleasure. One night, Ahmed overhears a female voice lamenting the separation from the beloved one and later finds out that he himself is the object of love. While Princess Gildena, as she's curled, uh, called in the German text, in further contortion of Antoine Gallon's rendering Gulnar, is forced to return to the sea with her companions. She's caught the next day and immediately brought to the ruler's presence. Even though Gildena does not speak, Ahmed is madly in love with her, sets all his wives free, as the text verbatim says, both marry and she eventually gives birth to a son. Only then does she summon her family and her father releases the magic spell that made her speechless. In a lengthy passage, her father explains that Gildena had transgressed the rules of the submarine world by falling in love with a human. Accordingly, her family had been forced to repudiate her. Now that her human husband has proved his true devotion to her, they are allowed to accept her again. The son is taken away by his uncle, who educates him and only returns him when Gildena, two years later, is giving birth to a second child, this time a daughter. Another year later, all of them visit the dying king, and while Ahmed marvels at the abundant wealth of the submarine realms, he's bewildered by not noticing signs of greed with the dying king's family. After they return to the world above, they live, as the text makes us understand, happily ever after. And never again does Gildena visit the submarine world she originated from. In the Arabic versions, the text is followed by the tale's second part, which is about twice as long and hence goes into much more detail. In consequence, the first part is reduced to a mere introduction. And the only time when the initial protagonist, Jul Lanar, enters the scene again is towards the end, when after numerous magical encounters, her son appears to be finally subdued by his female opponent, leaving his mother recourse to war as the only solution to free him. Even though the introductory passage is linked to the following part in several other ways, one might easily imagine the second part having been narrated on its own. The European adaptation, in contrast, 
elaborates the introductory passage to a fully-fledged narration in its own right. Moreover, it introduces a number of traits and arguments rooting the tale firmly within the contemporary European value system. Galon, at the beginning of the 18th century, had introduced the tale into a world of feudal order and courtly manners. A century later, the value system had changed. Instead of considerations about the feasibility of arranged marriage, the concept of individual love is now key. Instead of chance, it is her love that brings Gildena to the king. It is her love that makes her being repudiated by her people, and it is her husband's love that makes her family finally accept the situation. A recent comparison between Galland's original French text and its German translation by Johann Heinrich Voss at the end of the 18th century, vaguely contemporary with the Feen Märchen, has extracted similar tendencies working in that German translation. Whenever Galland would elaborate on courtly atmosphere, since his work addressed the French readers at court, Voss would transfer the like passages to the context, manners, and intellectual horizon of urban citizens constituting his own audience. Similarly, instead of wealth in the Arabian Nights, in the Feyen Märchen, it is now social responsibility that counts. The wonders of the sea are depicted with a certain awe, but eventually they only serve as a matrix for further reflections. The inhabitants of the submarine world dwell in gold and silver, yet they depart with their wealth freely, even though to be exact, in exchange for food. Moreover, they do not grieve for things gone by. Incidentally, the latter trait, besides showing similarities to another tale of the Arabian Nights, the tale of Abdallah the fisherman and Abdallah the merman, is repeatedly stressed in other tales of the German collection in which human foibles are criticized, with particular regard to exaggerated emotions. These characteristics are typical for the literature of the time, which is firmly impregnated by the atmosphere of the Enlightenment. And other tales in the collection explicitly contrast the former Dark Ages with the presently, that is 1801, enjoyed enlightened days. Obviously, the Oriental tale serves but as a background against which other ideas may be developed, this also being a general characteristic of contemporary European literature. In this particular case, the German narrator follows the strategy to introduce and underline moral as well as social concepts in order to develop the submarine world into a kind of future vision for humanity as a humanistic utopia. The third tale from the Hikayat to be discussed is a particularly peculiar case. The tale of the 40 girls features a young man, the youngest of three princes, who's repudiated by his father for having interpreted the letter's dream as an evil omen. Saved by a compassionate executioner, the prince reaches a castle that is inhabited by 40 warrior girls. As he hides in their castle, they aim to find him, but as they stay home, one after the other falls in love with him and fails to betray his existence to the others. Finally, their leader meets him, also falls in love and declares him her exclusive lover. One day, as the girls have to depart for some business, she entrusts him the keys to the treasury so that he may enjoy himself. Only one of the doors is not to be opened. Needless to mention that curiosity leads our hero to that particular door, and when looking into the room through a crack in the door, he notices a beautiful horse. Much to his surprise, the horse knows human speech, 
and invites him to free her. Even though at this very moment his beloved one arrives, he follows the horse's advice and flees. This is as much of the story as is relevant for the present discussion. The further turn of events has the prince, with the help of the magic horse, marry another princess and find out that his former beloved, that is the leader of the 40 girls, the, se the uh, enchanted horse and the princess are actually three sisters. Later, he's re reunited with his former beloved together with his 40 sons, already grown up, and eventually even meets his father, who forgives him and entrusts his own kingdom to him. In the Arabian Nights, the equivalent of the story constitutes the, the third and final episode in what is called the third Hollander's tale. After having been shipwrecked at, at the magnetic mountain and having inadvertently killed a young man living in hiding, the protagonist meets a group of ten one-eyed men in mourning. When he asks the reason for their action, they sue him into an animal hide, which is picked up by a giant bird who subsequently drops it on a high mountain. From there, the young man reaches the palace of the 40 girls, with whom he lives a joyful life for some time. When the girls have to leave him for a period of 40 days, they entrust the keys to him, and only the 40th chamber remains forbidden. As he finally opens the forbidden door on the 40th day, he finds a winged horse. Climbing onto the horse's back, he's transported back to his original place of depart, and before leaving, the horse whips out one of his eyes with its tail. Lamenting the lost pleasure, and not even permitted to compassionately join the group of mourners, he starts to roam the world. Claude Bremont has pointed out closely related variants of the latter version in the first tale of the Persian poets Nizami's Haft Pekare Bahram Gur, that's early 13th century, and in the fifth tale of the equally Persian Sidbat Nama. These tales, both of which are older than any of the Arabic ones, in their turn have given rise to numerous popular adaptations of the theme Repenting anything that cannot be changed is of no use. These tales usually follow the structure, first, gain of fairy wife, second, transgression of taboo, and third, irretrievable loss of fairy wife. In Arabic, two of the tales collected by Enolitman in Palestine and Egypt contain closely related episodes. In one of these, corresponding to one of the Palestinian folktales published by Hans Schmidt and Paul Kahle, the narrators did not content themselves with having the protagonist submerge in eternal grief. Instead, the king who listened to his tales feels perfectly justified to have the, pr the protagonist executed because of his stupid action. In another variation of the theme, the so-called Bulak edition of the Arabian Nights, probably resulting from lacuna, offers a highly reduced version of the third calendar's tale, in which the originally separated second and third episodes are merged. As in the second episode, the hero watches a group of people preparing an underground mansion. As soon as those people have left, he uncovers the mansion's lid, enters, and then comes the lacuna. As towards the end of the third episode, wanders through 39 beautiful gardens. When opening a door, he finds the magic horse that brings him back to the ten mournful youths and hits out one of his eyes. This version, by way of its Persian translations prepared in the Kaja period, was also popular as a Sep separate chapbook 
until mid-20th century Iran and might have given rise to further variations of the theme in oral tradition. As the available texts show, the motif of the horse hidden in the forbidden chamber predominantly offered itself in order to illustrate the particular theme of pleasure lost, or as Claude Bremont again has put it, et là sur le passé. The protagonist at first experiences pleasure to the extreme in what Robert Irwin and his companion to the Arabian Nights has termed a joyous celebration of sex, which in the narrator's perspective obviously consists of extensive sexual relations without feeling responsible for the consequences in terms of emotional bondage or offspring. The hero's responsibility is then put to the test by pointing out a taboo and thus granting him the potential to transgress it. A test he inevitably fails both for psychological and structural reasons. In the Hikayat version, the hero's unfaithfulness is balanced by the fact that the leader of the 40 girls is in fact a witch who had unjustly held her own sister, the enchanted horse imprisoned. As the ethics of success discussed in relation to the Arabian Nights by Peter Molan permit an unjust act to be countered by another one of the same kind, the hero not only escapes unharmed but is richly endowed with women, children, wealth and power. In the version of the Arabian Nights, the hero's transgression is justified by nothing else than his own curiosity. In consequence, he's reduced to his former state, which, after living through the utmost joy in the council of the girls, he now experiences as another extreme. While both versions employ similar motives, the argument they elaborate are different, and so are consequently, the narrative strategies employed. In the Hikayat version, the tale of the 40 girls constitutes an integral part of the narrative. It is linked to the tale's introduction by the heroes wandering in the desert, which eventually leads him to the castle of the girls. And it is also linked to the tale's further development in that the horse has a crucial role in advising and helping the hero. Any dramatic turn of events after the transgression of the taboo would hinder the tale's further flow. In fact, as in the Arabi Arabian Nights and other popular versions, it would lead to a final morale, obstructing a further continuation. In this way, in the Hekayat version, the tale of the 40 girls is rather less a tale of transgression, but mainly a tale about the acquisition of a helpful animal. The actual method of acquisition is not exact exactly typical of the genre where friendly behavior towards the supernatural in need, as in the case of the fight between the black and the white snake in the tale of Abu Muhammad, appear to be more logical. In the Arabian Nights, in contrast, the tale of the 40 girls is but one out of the general tale's three episodes that are not logically linked with each other, but rather constitute single units. While the tale might exist separately, as in fact it does, in several later popular versions in both Arabic and Persian, it is here linked to the preceding episode by means of a common moral whose overlapping point could read, destiny cannot be escaped. But while in the earlier episode, the hero unwittingly acts in order to fulfill the ordained fate, in the third episode, he suffers from a fated transgression. Even though it is tempting to interpret the hero's action as an individual act, of unfaithfulness, the presence of the ten morning youth in the frame story makes it clear that the transgression is an inevitable human characteristic. 
as a folklorist, and particularly speaking to a folklorist audience, I cannot avoid but making a point that tales, whether written down or orally performed, gain their meaning in the individual performance. And strict term, each performance creates a different tale. Well, performance in oral tradition means the recitation of a tale to a listening audience in reference to literature, performance in the first place refers to a given tale being fixed in writing. And only in the second place implies the reading of a tale by a specific individual. A researcher's perspective in reading tales written down further complicates matters. Now, it is not only the producer's and the recipient's perspective that matters, but also the researcher's gaze and expectation. It is the researcher's task to find a balanced judgment, burden as little as possible with presupposed or biased evaluations, and they have to remain aware of the fact that any of their readings is but one possibility of supplying meaning to a text whose context at the time of production is largely unknown. From the producer's side, narrative strategies are, besides such devices as the use of images, one way of achieving meaning. Hence, the uncovering of narrative strategies is a means of understanding why a tale has been produced the way we perceive it from today's perspective. In this way, in terms of narrative strategies, are the similar readings have been done earlier, and many more are needed in order to arrive at an adequate evaluation of the art of storytelling in classical Arabic tradition. It may come as a disappointment that neither of the studied collections allows the reconstruction of a coherent narrative strategy on the part of its author or authors. In particular, the Arabian Nights make it difficult to extract a discernible intention since their heterogeneous character as an omnim gatherum permits to integrate just about each and every kind of tale. Western readers with their specific cultural notions such as authorship, individuality, originality or plagiarism ought to be aware of the reign of different concepts in pre-modern Arabic literature. Even though the Arabian Nights may appear as a haphazard collection, put together for the simple joy of numerical integrity, the narrative universe they offer is not only marvelous, but also highly instructive in its embedded cultural notions that may, in the end, enable us to learn more about the Islamic other than the face value pretends. Thank you very much.